And welcome to another season of Lifestyle Gardening. I'm Kim Todd. I'm thrilled you could join us for our winter program. We've got a great show for you today. We'll help beginning homeowners understand what they have around their homes. We'll also do some wintertime scouting on those seed bearing plants. And finally, we'll hear from industry professionals about how they keep public plants going through the winter months. But first, we're going to hear from that critter specialist, Dennis Ferraro, He's going to be focusing on how to keep all of our pets safe from some of those everyday items we use around the home. When we think about the safety of any kind of pesticides or fertilizers around our home, you gotta remember those things are rated for the safety to people. We call that the LD50, but it's rated for homo sapiens, people. It's not the same for our pets. Now it's close if our pets are mammals, dogs and cats, but if you have pets such as turtles roam around the yard, or if you have a pond with frogs or fish, or if you have birds in your house, you have to remember that these pesticides act very differently on these other types of animals. Uh, for instance, people don't realize that just one cigarette butt, if it actually gets into the water of a pond, that can easily kill because of the nicotine, which is very, very susceptible for killing amphibians, a hundred tadpoles. Just one cigarette butt would kill a hundred tadpoles. The other things we don't realize is that we don't think about our animals going and eating fertilizer or eating weed killer or eating uh, grub control on our lawn. But just think about it, if a cat starts scratching or a dog runs across the lawn and one of those little granulars that has the pesticide gets between their pads or their paws, what they're gonna do? They're gonna lick it and eat it. Now, you have a different avenue or path of contamination or problems because they are actually ingesting the poison instead of just touching it. So sure, an average fertilizer, an average pesticide granular on the skin of a dog or cat is not gonna cause a problem. But if they ingest it, it can easily cause a problem. The other things we have to worry about is plants. A lot of plants, we call them natural, and they have natural botanicals, such as things as neem, or um, plants like marigolds or others. There are many animals that eat those plants. They're not native to this area, or native to where they developed, and they ingest that, those plants, and those also can become very highly toxic to those animals. We think about fumes in a home. There could be things that we don't think of as toxic fumes, but to a bird, it can easily cause it to succumb. So when you're going through these things, remember, it acts very different when it comes to other animals. So if it says it's safe, and it may be safe for pets, it may not be safe for the frogs, the fish, or any other animals in your yard. So definitely check things. Another thing you may want to think about is before you check things, check them for that animal. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that sometimes to stop mosquitoes from biting us, we use things, are, we, we think that they're natural, like skin so soft, or um, limamine, which is just citric acid. It, yes, that will kill um, things like mosquitoes and insects. But did you know just one tiny drop of caffeine on your fingers from coffee or a citric acid from an orange will kill a frog immediately? So. Before you go ahead, if you have other animals in your yard, or if you care about the other biodiversity in your yard, definitely look on how it affects those animals. Look at the label. It'll tell you if it's susceptible to wetland creatures or fish. It's great to get another perspective on this because when we say the word pet, most people think cats and dogs. But if you've got a home pond with turtles, fish, or frogs, be extra careful about the pesticides you use, as well as those items that Dennis talked about. 
If you've seen our program before, you know our Go Gardening features are designed to help those who are just getting started in gardening. And we thought to kick off this year, we would help those of you who may have moved into a new property. In order to have a beautiful and vibrant outdoor living space, you first have to know what you have to work with. And that's the topic of this week's Go Gardening. You might recall that Go Gardening is focused on beginning gardeners, people who really are interested but might not necessarily know what they're doing. We're going to take a step all the way back and start with what you should be thinking about if you have a new residence, brand new, new construction, new to you, a renovation that you have in mind, anything that has to do with your home, your business, your property, and what you want your landscape to be. This is before you go to the garden center and buy that plant and come home with it and say, what do I do now? The process is really pretty simple. It can be intimidating to people who don't fully understand that if you follow this process, the end result is likely going to be far more satisfying than again, going off and buying something that you don't know where you're going to put. We start with the fact, just the facts. This is hard for some people to understand as well because facts are just facts. There's no subjectivity, there is no recommendation associated with it. It is simply, what do you have? So on your property, you have to figure out what you've got before you know what you want and how you're going to get what you've got to get to where you want it to go. So we have lots of tools you can use. The beauty of the digital age is you can go onto a search engine, go to Google Maps or any of the other mapping tools Find your property, zoom in on it to the point where you need, where you can see things, use the little measure tool so that you can figure out dimensions, what exactly is where, or if you are fortunate enough to have from your county assessor's office website or from a set of construction documents, you can use the construction document. And that will show you where the utility easements are, the actual property itself, perhaps the existing plant material, usually not by name, but at least where they're located, the dimensions of the house, all those sorts of things that ultimately are going to affect your decisions on what you want your landscape to be. So these are just a couple of those different tools you can use. People are also very intimidated by the fact that they can't draw. Well, I can't draw either. I'm terrible at it. You don't need to be able to draw to simply do some sketches and scribbles and more importantly, some notes on what do you have. So if we move from here are a couple of base documents to the actual zooming in and analyzing or inventorying what you've got, it is everything from what is the direction of the wind in the summer and in the fall? Are there places where the wind swirls and twirls and you end up with leaves everywhere? What is the angle of the sun? Do you have areas that are never in full sun or never in full shade? Is that sun filtered? What are the existing trees and shrubs and perennials? There are also some good apps that will tell you what those are or at least get you close. And of course, you can always send Backyard Farmer a picture and we will try to identify it for you. But again, you have to know what those plants are so that you can make a decision about whether you like where they are are they in good condition? Do they really fit in with what you want to be able to do? You also have to look at the slope because slope is essential and the soils. So those are pretty simple. It's what you've got. Where is it? Take notes, make notes. That becomes the first part of doing the analysis and the assessment before you get into actually figuring out what you want on your own property. All of those factors are going to matter when you start thinking of installing new turf, planting shrubs, or getting a garden started. Going at it blindly could result in poor plant health and cause you a lot more headaches down the road. Next time on Go Gardening, we're going to build on this feature by helping you begin a master plan for your landscape. Our landscape lesson this week continues this idea of knowing what you have, and you might have some trouble with plants that look great in the winter, but set seed. You could look at this two ways. One way is to welcome more beautiful plants. Another way is they might take over your landscape if you leave them untended. 
So let's take a few minutes to see some samples of those plants that set a lot of seed. These beautiful winter days make many of us want to go outside and play in our gardens. However, there are not very many things we can do to get ready for spring to come, with one really pretty neat exception. And that would be take a look at what sets seed in your landscape, and then figure out, especially if you are a little bit new to the gardening world, whether what sets seed is going to produce all sorts of unwanted seedlings. Some examples that I'm going to talk about are Euonymus, winter creeper Euonymus, which is fabulous, enjoyed by the birds, goes vertical, puts on these beautiful seeds that look a little bit like seeds of bittersweet, and the birds absolutely relish them. Another is, of course, the juniper or the cedar. Many, many of our cedars are really becoming a problem in the landscape, and that does include in areas that are actually urban parts of uh, the state. Then we get into some of the perennials and the grasses. Some of the ornamental alliums, like this one, which happens to be garlic chives, you can actually see some of the seeds still remaining in the heads of these particular plants, which means that in this landscape, that homeowner is going to have to look for all of those little onion seedlings coming up all over everything. Then we have some of the grasses, which can be absolutely gorgeous and deadly in terms of seedling production. This is northern sea oats. What looks like a single seed and all of those little dangling seed heads is actually many, many seeds. They will also come up in profusion all over the landscape in the spring. And of course, we have plants like asters, which the fluff turns into seeds, seedlings turn into plants. So what this really is, is a cautionary note to say, look at what you've got that is beautiful in seed. Take those seed heads off, even now if you want to, but certainly if you don't want seedlings of many of your beautiful winter plants in your landscape for the coming season, think about that, get rid of those seeds earlier next fall, or pay attention early in the spring to what is coming up in your landscape. It's going to be much easier to manage if you take care of those garden thugs in the fall by getting rid of those seed heads. Take a look around your home on one of these really nice winter days to check for any, any heavy seed bearers. Get rid of them quickly if you don't want more in the spring. You know, we love to bring you some insights from folks in the industry, and we like to focus on topics that home gardeners will appreciate. So this week, we're excited to talk with Alice Reed from Lincoln Parks and Rec. Alice has been involved with planning, selecting, and planting at the Sunken Gardens and other public areas here in Lincoln for many years. She's going to talk to us about how they overwinter many of the beautiful plants we see every year at Sunken Gardens. It's my pleasure to be talking with Alice Reed with Lincoln Parks and Recreation Public Gardens section today about everything that we see in these beautiful greenhouses and what it has to do with sunken gardens. So Alice, just exactly what are we looking at? Mm -hmm. And since we interviewed Rich Finke about what they are doing for sunken gardens, what is this all about? Well, this is the public garden holding area and we hold all the plants over, the standards, the bulbs, the banana trees, the grasses, all those temperennials that we hold over that are special for sunken gardens and around the city. These are rather unusual greenhouses because they're not really a greenhouse. What are the conditions that these plants need to be able to overwinter, whether they are truly tropical or they are the water plants that we see in all of the fish ponds at sunken gardens? Well, we have held these plants for several years so we've needed a holding greenhouse forever just to overwinter these plants so we don't have to buy them every year. So this is a Polytech holding house. The sides go up and down. There's no cooling system per se, just fans and a heating system. So we just keep it at a temperature throughout the winter to hold these plants in a state where they won't freeze. When we're harvesting, as we call it, we bring in a lot of different plants all at once and we'll start to pare them down a little bit, clean them up, see what's good and in the meantime we're working on our designs for next year so we'll decide on how many centerpieces, where these standards will go 
and then we'll work on preparing and propagating those plants for that, for those designs. It's the big plants that are carryover plants, standards, banana trees, the grasses, mother plants, stock plants. And then we'll divide those out through the winter time to the numbers of the plants that we need for our designs. Um, we clean the bulbs up, we shear back all these plants. They come in huge and we reduce them down. We clean the bugs off of them, repot them and get them ready to go out for next year. And that's what we do in the winter is work on numbers. Alice, you carry over a lot of plants from year to year because people love them, like the elephant ears and the bananas. Yes. Are there any unusual or special plants that maybe are not in here that we might be seeing in Sunken Gardens this year? Well, we have all sorts of surprises in mind. We usually travel around a lot and see other gardens and see what's new and different out there. And then we'll try to bring it back to Lincoln. Um, one thing we had last year was chocolate mimosa trees which are deciduous, but they're just add new, something we had seen out there. Um, and holding over these nice lantanas in different colors, and datiras, brugmansias, those are all new and different this year. Alice, thanks for taking the time to talk with us today, and we are really looking forward to what we're going to see in Sunken Gardens next year. Thanks for coming over, Kim, and we're glad to show off what we're gonna make for next year's gardens to make it beautiful in Lincoln, so. Thank you for coming over. We really appreciate getting a chance to talk to Alice to hear about how their winter storage program keeps those beautiful plants going for years. Later on in the show, we're going to return to the city winter storage area to hear about some specific plants, including some aquatic ornamentals and how they survive the winter months. Since this is a partner program to Backyard Farmer, we'd like to take a few minutes to answer some of your questions. We love hearing from you. If you've got some questions or pictures, you can send them our way by emailing byf at unl.edu. While you're at it, you can attach a picture or two in JPEG format. Please tell us as much information as you can, including which part of the state you live in. Okay, so our first question comes to us today from, we don't know, but it doesn't matter because this is one that is really important to a lot of people. This is a viewer who started walking in the backyard, dreaming about those future plantings, which is great in our winter months. He noted these fissures in the yard, first dismissed them as something his children had done, then realized it's an entire maze through the backyard. He attached these great photos. He did quiz the kids, but they said they didn't do it, and no, indeed, they did not. He hopes the earth isn't opening up in fissures. If it did, it would swallow what has caused them in the first place, which is voles. And our good old critter creature, Denner, Dennis, talks about voles on our show all the time. Those fissures are classic under the snow, under the mulch, under plants. You see them along the surface of the ground, tunneling, and then of course they go underground. They do all sorts of nasty damage. They love plant parts, so they will eat the roots of those plants from beneath. Easiest way to get rid of voles, besides moving of course, is you can set snap traps perpendicular in lots of locations. Our, our good entomologist Jody did that. She caught mice, she caught voles. They're hard to bait. The population also crashes on occasion, but one of the things you also can do is remove some of that cover and make sure that they don't have places where they can dart into the lawn out of other places in your landscape. And on our website and in previous YouTube videos, we have a lot of information about how you can control voles. I feel your pain, they're all over in my yard too. All right, so we also have a question today from all the way up in Crofton. And this is a, a very loyal viewer, thanks for sending the pictures. He has a 30 year old, 30 foot tall spruce, five of them actually, and one of them is showing this damage. Unfortunately, you know, it's a little hard to tell the damage from a distance, but I would suspect that if we had Kyle or Amy or Lauren standing in place right now, they would say, look and see whether you actually have a canker up in the crown at the base of some of those twigs. And, and that could in fact be what's happening. Um, you would, that would cause the twig to die back, especially if it is a canker that has um, encircled the twig in that location. 
some sort of damage in that particular spot is probably what has happened. Not a thing you can do about it, especially if it is a canker. If it is a disease, which it really doesn't look like at this point, that would be something that you would have to get up on, send a sample into Kyle. This question comes to us from Lynch, Nebraska. She found multiples of these in the same area. Great pictures. She describes them as she thought it was a turtle egg until she picked it up. It's this star-shaped leaf-like thing attached to the back. We had a couple of these earlier in the season, really for maybe the first or second time in ever, as long as I've been hosting the show. This is actually an earth star fungus. Beautiful thing, it starts out, it's kind of a puff ball to begin with, and then the actual star-shaped piece opens up on the outside layer. That is directly associated with how much moisture there is. So if it's very moist, you don't get that to open up. It doesn't look like the star closes back up again. Um, they like drier sort of open areas. You will find them in the lawn on occasion, but they are just one of those great, wonderful fungi to enjoy as they come out of the ground and really do look like an earth star. So we really appreciate getting that from Lynch, Nebraska. We also have a question today uh, from a viewer who had a great high tunnel, or actually not a high tunnel, a little covered, uh, covered his garden, extended his season with a little tiny hoop that he created out of PVC pipe and some plastic, we assume, just like we did. Thought we'd show this to you because he said he actually used this. He harvested carrots all the way up till Thanksgiving. He did have some spinach in it, but of course spinach is one of those vegetables that likes it cold but doesn't like it too cold. Not much to protect that spinach foliage when it really, really gets cold. So that didn't work for him. But great idea, great for him to actually have done that extension of his own season in his garden and made it work so that he could harvest carrots and probably some other things either earlier in, in the fall or come spring when we actually start to put the plastic back on our own hoop house in the backyard farmer garden. For our final feature today, we're going to return to the city winter storage area to hear about how plants like banana trees and aquatics make it through the cold season here in Nebraska. Here's Lincoln City Parks and Rec's Mike Fallon and Zach Halley, former students of ours, to tell you more. We are at the greenhouses for Lincoln Parks and Rec Public Gardens section where we overwinter a lot of our annuals that we use throughout the year. Right now we are looking at some of these red bananas which when we take in in the winter can be a very laborious process. As you can see some of these are close to 100 pounds or so. Uh, when we bring them in after that first frost they start out about 15 to 20 feet tall. We'll cut them off and bring them in. Uh, with a lot of the red bananas, we will divide them and overwinter a little cooler. As you can see, there's some upshoots coming from here. When we divide these, we'll quarter them up and plant them in our mix. Uh, that way, when they're ready to go next spring, we start growing them out in January, February. We'll bump up the heat in the greenhouse to get these things growing so that they'll get to that 15 to 20 feet in the next year. When it's time to get them outside is when we get all of our regular annuals in flats delivered because they will fill this greenhouse to the brim. So we actually have a shade structure outside that will keep these in in the late spring before we put them in the garden. So we do harden them off for about two to three weeks. Uh, that just ensures that once we put them in the garden after the frost free date, that they'll be ready to go. They do not bear bananas as they require, I believe it's three years of growth before they start to bear fruit. And we just don't keep it warm enough to do that. So along with the bulbs, we have aquatic plants that we overhold in this greenhouse. Uh, we have a variety of aquatics that we bring in uh, come fall before the freeze. Uh, anything from illustrious elephant ears to uh, black elephant ears, rush, uh, water hyacinths, and uh, king tut papyrus. Uh, the king tut papyrus is actually probably one of the more interesting things. It's a, this plant here, it's a 
kind of a corner piece of every pond each year. As far as divisions go, this is just one division. This year, pull these out in the fall, it'll be a massive plant that takes three of us to uh, get out along with shovels. We actually have to physically get in the ponds and try to not disturb the liner and dig it out at the same time. This is the water hyacinth here. We keep these kind of contained in the corner. They do spread quite a bit, so each year we'll only keep about 10 or 10 or 12 sprigs. The tropical lilies, we, we have two different types of lilies in the gardens. We have tropical lilies and hardy lilies. The tropical lilies we actually take out each year. So we try to have about uh, four in each pond, different varieties. Uh, the bloom type on them is way different than anything you see with the hardy native lilies. So they're a huge attraction to the gardens. Uh, with with the, the tropical lilies, we uh, keep them in the greenhouse at a, about a 50 degree temperature where the hardy lilies, they can just go back to the ground in the pond. So this greenhouse allows us to overwinter all these plants for the sunken garden so they'll be ready for next year. This technique is not only a good way to keep plants going in the winter, but it's also a great way to save public money. Instead of having to purchase new plants every season, some can be kept in this controlled environment and brought out again in the spring for all of us to enjoy. You know, we'll be looking forward to seeing all of the beautiful ornamentals and those arrangements at Sunken Gardens, as always, this season. Thank you so much for joining us again for Lifestyle Gardening. On our next program, we'll be showing you how to clean your garden tools, we'll have some helpful pruning tips, and we'll hear about landscape plans for new homeowners. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. So good morning, good gardening. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time on Lifestyle Gardening.